How's it going, mates? Here's Dr. Borja Bandera. How are you, healthy YouTube family? Today, 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 it's gone out of focus on me. Focus here, here, here. Today I'm going to talk about what happens in your body when you decide to eliminate carbohydrates from your diet. And since it's something that more and more people are doing, sometimes justified, sometimes unjustified, but more and more of you are doing it. So I think it's interesting for you to know more or less what's going to happen from the moment you leave carbohydrates onwards. The first thing you need to be clear about, you empowered, informed people, is that not all carbohydrates are the bad guys, okay? There are bad or not recommended carbohydrates, but then there are many others that are recommended. The ones we need to avoid have a first and last name. They are the refined carbohydrates, the afternoon cookies, the sugary cereals for breakfast, the white bread for lunch, the industrial pastries, those that contain pre-cooked or ultra-processed foods, I think you know what we're talking about. Those are the ones that always need to be eliminated under any circumstances. Whether you're on a low-carb diet, a ketogenic diet, obviously if you're on a ketogenic diet they won't be present, or you're on a conventional diet without carbohydrate restriction. But there are some circumstances that I've mentioned in many videos where it may be convenient, temporarily or not, to remove, eliminate or reduce the amount of carbohydrates from the diet. So today what I'm going to explain to you is what's going to happen if you decide to eliminate or reduce the amount of carbohydrates from your diet. First, phase number one, from here to there, which could last a few days, but let's say it lasts about a week. This is the hardest phase, the phase that will cost you the most, but understanding it well, well, you can save yourself a lot of trouble. In this phase, you will find yourself more tired, with muscle weakness. And this is because you have been oxidizing glucose, sugar, for practically your entire life, and your body. Your muscles, your cells, your brain is used to using that fuel. Suddenly, you remove that fuel from the diet, and sometimes you do it very abruptly. Luckily, we have a way of generating energy that is not the oxidation of glucose, which is very efficient and is the oxidation of fat. But this doesn't happen from 0 to 100 in an instant. This requires a metabolic adaptation process. It's like if your car that always uses gasoline, well now you want it to run on diesel overnight. It's a different fuel and requires an adaptation period. During that adaptation period, you're going to feel tired, you're going to feel knocked down, you're going to feel like not wanting to go out and train, you're going to sometimes have a headache. At this point, you might think, this is not for me, I feel so bad, I knew this was not a good idea, this can't be healthy, and this is where a lot of people give up. And they leave that carbohydrate restriction and start eating carbohydrates again. But the good thing is that this is temporary. The headache can also appear. And what causes the headache? It's due to three processes. When you restrict carbohydrates from the diet, diuresis increases. That is, you lose more fluid through urine. Natriuresis increases, that is, you lose more sodium through urine. It also increases caluresis. A very cool name. Caluresis. 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 Caluresis is the loss of potassium through urine. If not stopped by increased fluid intake, it can cause volume depletion and headaches initially. These can lead to irritability and mood changes, making you not want to talk to anyone or do anything. Uh, you just want to lock yourself in your room and be left alone. This is what is known in English as carbohydrate withdrawal. It's something that's compared to withdrawal from an addictive substance, but it's not really like that. Even though many people live it, experience it, perceive it as withdrawal from an addictive substance. I'm not the one making the comparison, but many people do say, I'm going through carbohydrate withdrawal. And the good part, the only good part of this first phase, which seems to be all bad things, is that there is a very powerful initial weight loss of about three to four kilos, sometimes more, and in a few days. What happens when people say, I'm going to step on the scale and see four kilos less in days? They get very happy. They get very happy and say, wow. Uh, it was worth it. But what happens, guys? Not everything is so beautiful. It turns out that this initial weight loss in 80-85% is not fat. Sadly, fat does not oxidize that quickly. 
It needs more time to oxidize. Well then, what is glycogen in water? How are carbohydrates stored? How is glucose stored in the body? I've said it many times. Primarily in the form of glycogen in the liver and muscle. What happens? Glycogen, which are basically glucose molecules joined by bonds forming very long chains, has the ability to hydrate and water molecules stick to the glycogen molecules. So on one hand they swell the muscle, glycogen gives you volume. That's why those of you who train and do a carbohydrate load, for example, swelling with rice or swelling with pizza or swelling with some source of carbohydrates at night will see that you wake up swollen, but strong swollen is the turgid muscle. That's glycogen. So what happens when we cut off the carbohydrate supply from the diet? Well, that glycogen is gradually consumed because as you know, the body prefers to oxidize glucose. So the reserves of hepatic and muscular glycogen are consumed and that makes you lose weight because that glycogen weight, you lose water and also lose volume. People lose volume, lose belt size and say, wow, I like this, let's continue with week two. What happens in week two? Well, positive things that we like start to appear. For example, one of the most interesting things is that abdominal bloating decreases. A lot of people, a whole lot, have digestive symptoms. They have symptoms of abdominal bloating, presence of abdominal distension, of gas meteorism, of difficulty in digestion, and those digestive symptoms, well, they greatly worsen the quality of life. Many are due to excessive fermentation of carbohydrates by colonic bacteria, bacteria in the colon. What happens when we reduce the amount of carbohydrates? Well, usually gas, inflammation, abdominal distension, and digestive symptoms decrease. And this makes people say, wow, I've lost volume again, I've lost belt size, my clothes fit better, I'm not bloated. Bloated all day, I feel better, lighter, I'm cool, everything's fine, we continue. A not so positive effect is halitosis. Your breath will start to smell differently and this is because you are starting to generate so-called ketone bodies. A product of increased fat oxidation when you remove carbohydrates from your diet. This at first can cause that, certain halitosis. Your mouth smells like a mythical creature. But they also decrease cravings, especially cravings for sweet things, which ruin the dietary efforts of many people. But also hunger in general decreases, there are fewer episodes of trips to the fridge and kitchen, and that in the long run also helps you lose weight and lose fat. At this point, which can range from the second to the fourth week approximately, your body is already making use of fat. This is known as lipolysis. You are adapting to fat oxidation and your body is using that alternative fuel that we should all use, but we don't use because we are constantly carbohydrates, 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 and we don't give way to the use of fat. If this is accompanied by a caloric restriction that doesn't have to be very large, moderate of about 300 to 500 calories, then you are going to lose subcutaneous fat, which is the most visible, the one that is seen here in the saddlebags, in the belly, in the legs, in the hips. But also, and this is more important, you are going to lose visceral fat, which is the truly dangerous one. It's the one that increases your risk of diseases like cardiovascular disease and other killers. And this increased lipolysis is going to give you more metabolic flexibility, which is a concept that means your metabolism is now capable of oxidizing glucose, when you give it glucose, but also of oxidizing fat when you don't give it glucose, whether you're fasting or exercising at an appropriate intensity. Using both glucose and fat, being flexible in the oxidation of substrates is metabolic flexibility, and it's a positive thing. It's something that has been associated with a lower risk of chronic disease. And then comes the chronic phase, phase three, the most advanced phase, let's say, when you've been on a low or restricted carbohydrate diet for more than a month, where the good stuff comes in. The good stuff takes time. When you restrict carbohydrates, the good stuff and the symptoms that make people fall in love with this lifestyle take time to arrive, but they do arrive. This is when you'll find yourself with more concentration because the levels of ketone bodies are stabilizing and you have intermittent exposure to ketone bodies as long as your diet is low enough in carbohydrates. There's a concept that I'll develop in another video.
and that is that even though people think that only with an ultra ultra mega low carbohydrate ketogenic diet do ketone bodies get generated this is not entirely true and if you're an active person who trains you can probably generate ketone bodies with more carbohydrates I'm talking about up to 15-20% of calories coming from carbohydrates. But this, I'll keep quiet, we'll talk about it in another video. You'll have to watch it when it comes out if you subscribe and hit the bell so it sends you the notification and so you can watch it and not miss anything. There's a clear improvement in mood. When in phase 1 there was irritability, in phase 3 it's the complete opposite. People feel better, they find themselves smiling, they find themselves more emotionally stable without so many ups and downs. Just like energy also increases and stabilizes. People don't have to take a two hour nap after eating because energy levels drop. Energy stays somewhat more stable and you can stay more productive throughout the day without, as I say, having to crash on the couch because you can't take it anymore at two in the afternoon. Which also happens to a lot of people, of course, you're going to be reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes and other chronic diseases. And it's all, this, all these symptoms that generate the hook and make people feel so good and make this a lifestyle. What happens is that you guys don't fall into the danger of idealizing carbohydrate restriction. We shouldn't idealize anything. Perhaps what we should demonize is our Western lifestyle. The excess of refined carbohydrates sedentary lifestyle and everything we do wrong. This should be the norm. It should be healthy, but we shouldn't idealize any lifestyle in general unless the low carb lifestyle. If it has worked well for you, great. You can tell it, you can say, hey, this has worked for me. Maybe it will work for you, but there is no need to deify, idealize this lifestyle and discredit other dietary approaches that are equally valid. And guys, I closed the video as I opened it. Carbohydrates are not bad because yes, they are the only non-essential macronutrient. Fats are essential and proteins are essential. If you don't take them, you die, but not carbohydrates. But, but, but not all are bad. I've said it. Not all are bad. We have to eliminate refined carbohydrates. And once this very negative group is eliminated, we can consider doing periods of carbohydrate restriction or not in another video. I will tell you good sources of carbohydrates, sources of carbohydrates that will even facilitate fat loss. Yes, as you're hearing it. But if you want to see that video, well, you'll have to subscribe and hit the... Yes, guys. I hope the video was useful. A big hug. See you next time. Keep empowering.